Welcome and thank you all for joining us today for the Find It Early webinar, a free educational event about recent changes to breast cancer screening recommendations and access policy, sponsored by the National Women's Health Network and densebreastinfo.org. I'm Adele Costa, the Director of Communications for the network, and I'll be your MC today. A couple of quick housekeeping things. Uh, we do have a staff person monitoring the chat, so that's where you can direct any technical assistance or topical questions. However, we will not be able to answer questions about breast cancer live on this call. Uh, we will be sending out a post-event FAQ document to all attendees that address questions posed in the chat. And if you're listening to this recording, um, you can send any questions you have uh, about breast cancer to alerts at nwhn.org. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our panelists. Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro is our keynote speaker today. DeLauro introduced the Find It Early Act earlier this year. This is federal legislation that, if passed into law, would ensure all health insurance plans cover screening and diagnostic mammograms, breast ultrasounds, and MRIs at no cost to the healthcare consumer. Joanne Pushkin is the executive director of densebreastinfo.org. Pushkin has written dozens of educational courses, articles, grants, and speeches on the topic of breast density and its relationship to breast cancer risk. She learned of her own breast density's masking effect on her mammogram after finding a palpable lump, which went undetected by mammography several years in a row. Ms. Pushkin's advocacy has helped see many state and federal laws passed that have increased access to high quality breast cancer screening services, such as New York State's Breast Density Inform Bill and the FDA's Mammography Quality Standards Act. And last but certainly not least, Denise Hyader Lindenmuth is the Executive Director of the National Women's Health Network. Hyder Lindenmuth is a public health expert and the former Executive Director of the American Cancer Society. She received a crash course in this issue when she was diagnosed with an aggressive form of breast cancer by chance in 2011. Although she'd been dutifully getting mammograms for years, it was self-detection that brought her into the exam room after an unrelated Achilles tendon injury caused her to contort in a resting position that helped her feel a hard to find lump. A warm welcome to all of you. And now without further ado, my first few questions are for Congresswoman Deloro. Congresswoman. Hello, uh, it's an honor. Um, so my first question, uh, so for those of you the who may not be familiar, um, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force uh, is an independent volunteer panel of national experts in disease prevention and evidence-based medicine. Can you talk more about how this task force's recommendations have informed the cost of breast cancer screenings and how the Find It Early Act attempts to fix these issues? Sure. First of all, let me just say good afternoon to everyone and I uh, want to say a thank you to you, Adele, uh, as the Director of Communications. And uh, let me, I give a shout out to you, to the team that you are in charge of, of really helping uh, to shape uh, uh, people's understanding and, and uh, uh, of, of health policy, but also strategically of, uh, shaping policy and, and being able to uh, access um, uh, uh, accurate, unbiased information across the country. Um, I also want to just say, uh, uh, recognize Joanne Pushkin uh, of the uh, densebreastinfo.org. Critical, really, and I have to say thank you uh, for help in drafting the Find an Early Act and to make sure that we got all the details right in that in that effort. Uh, and Denise, to you, uh, the, the, as you know, executive director of the Health um, Network. So I, I really am so delighted to be partners with all of you. In this, in, in this fight. And just this personal point, I'm a 35 year cancer survivor, ovarian cancer, uh, I might add. But, um, and I believe that it's early detection, uh, which has saved my life, but as well as, you know, the grace of God and the hardworking medical professionals and biomedical research. So, um, uh, and that's why we move forward with this piece of legislation. Now, let me get to your, um, uh, to your, to, to, to your question. Um, I, 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 first of all, um, I was pleased when the um, the the uh, the commission came out with uh, 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 the, the standards that um, the task force that 
recommended that women begin breast cancer screening at age 40. I, you know, I was really complimentary of that. Positive decision, uh, again, detecting early, saving lives. But uh, on that score, I am concerned about recommendation that only suggests biennial screenings. I think women should have screenings uh, annually. Now, then we get to the, um, uh, the dense breast issue. 45% of women over the age of 40, uh, 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 have, uh, they've not been in a position to be able uh, uh, to be, uh, uh, we've not been able to be as effective in catching early stage breast cancer. Um, uh, now, we had two reasons here. One is that it was frustrating that the FDA um, has, didn't release uh, the notification standards. This is the issue of notification and coverage. Those are the two uh, pillars here. And um, uh, that, that letting women know that they have dense breasts. And I'm, for one, have dense breasts. So um, uh, this is critically important to me. Uh, now, those uh, um, uh, efforts will be um, uh, uh, addressed when the notification standards will go out uh, effective September 10th in 2024. So now women will know something about this. So they will have a notification. And so what we need to do is to make sure once they have that notification that to be able to do an MRI or ultrasound uh, in order to uh, 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 really have the additional screenings they, they, they need, that that needs to be uh, uh, free of charge. That needs to be covered by insurance. Uh, and that's the only way we were gonna save lives. Now, what um, uh, I took umbrances with, with the, uh, uh, the USP STF, the, the, uh, uh, the, this task force, is they did not make a recommendation on dense breasts. And I find that very, very troubling. And I so stated it with them because, and they told me they needed more study. And I checked, I checked with the head of MD Anderson, et cetera. We do not need any more studies. That in fact, we have what we need to be able to proceed ahead to make sure that we get there because we require their stamp of approval in order for the insurance companies to be able to, to, co to cover the, these costs. And I made it very plain uh, 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 to them that in fact, what they would be ab about here is uh, uh, really risking women's lives. And we're all about, you are, your audience is all about saving women's lives. That's what this has been, been about. So I'm deeply, deeply concerned with what they did uh, in, in, in this area. Now that is gonna prevent us from dealing with uh, screening, diagnostic mammograms, breast ultrasounds, MRIs, because we know that if there is a, a, if there isn't no cost sharing, that you take a look at what the costs are, women are not going to go and do that. This could cost more than a thousand dollars to get done. So they're just going to not do it, you know. And unfortunately, we put their lives at risk. And this task force, I'm going to say it plainly, has put women's lives at risk. Thank you, uh, Representative, for that um, invaluable context. I think a lot of folks don't understand sometimes how these task force and these, you know, uh, mini publics kind of interact with um, these big decisions that affect individuals. You also gave us a, a two for answer there. Uh, you anticipated my second question, which was, you know, without insurance coverage, right? Uh, women are being forced to pay out of pocket for these additional screenings. Um, you kind of just touched on it, but like, can you talk more about the cost associated with these screenings and why these costs specifically worsen health inequities? Right. Well, look, as I said, it's our understanding. Um, you, you, you know, let me just go back for one second on this. I think one of the strengths of the Affordable Care Act, really, mm -hmm. One of the real differences that the Affordable Care Act, there were many things, but the ability to get preventive care and treatment at, you know, without any cost sharing. And particularly, that is what the strength of the ACA was with regard to women. And for the first time, women's health was being treated uh, in the same way as men's health was. And this is the same thing. 
If you're going to look at out-of-pocket costs and they're forced to pay that, um, uh, uh, that it, it, and as I said, what we understand is it could be a thousand dollars, it could be more, and women should not have to pay more out of pocket than men to be able to get a clean bill of health. It's wrong. Um, uh, and and what 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 do, you, what do you get? You get you, you make a choice. Women are forced to make a choice. You know your health and maybe your life. You know at 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 at, at risk. Uh, 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 because if you're not able to pay for the treatments. Um, uh, that, you know, that puts women's health uh, on a lower scale. Uh, it doesn't really respect women's health. It doesn't, uh, 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 you, you know, the mammogram is not enough for women with dense breasts punish them for something they cannot control. Uh, if only they could, uh, 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 if that was the case and they didn't need to do anything else, but we know, we know, we've seen all the, 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 the screenings, we've seen that what happens with not being able to identify a tumor and which the other screenings are the way to do this. Uh, and through no fault of their own, women are being uh, uh, punished. Yeah, and thank you for that, you know, that that insight. Um, you you anticipate, uh, you know, Joanne is going to show us a picture actually later of exactly what that masking does. Um, I also wanted to raise, you know, that your your comments about these prohibitive costs, this is not academic. Um, we know that in, in this economy, right, most women can't afford a $400 emergency expense, right? And we're talking about things in the thousands. So when you say we're making a choice, that is, you know, that point is well taken. Um, it's an impossible choice. You know, and if you say, today, this is not just a soundbite. People are living paycheck to paycheck, are struggling to pay bills every month. You pointed out they're not able to deal with a $400 emergency. But we lose sight that there is a continuous, and it's right now, cost of living crisis in the United States. That is the single biggest economic factor in people's lives today. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, we, we hear the same from our uh, supporters for sure. Um, and you also, you know, in your answer, you spoke, um, you know, you expressed some very, uh, some frustration about how, you know, task force and other uh, bodies seem to, they want more, they want more science, they want more studies, right? But we know here at the network, and you know, right, that women's health research is often overlooked, devalued, underfunded. Um, let's talk about that. Like, wh why, wh what are some of the reasons for that? And how does this lack of research put women at risk for more adverse health outcomes? Well, and I'll just say something, which I said to the task force, uh, a, a per personnel. I asked them how long it took to deal with uh, getting what they needed or they thought they needed to get to go from age 49 to age 40. Years. Years. So now you're going to tell me that we need more information, more science that, that and, and what we already have, which is going to be years more and during that period of time, women will die. That's, that's the essence of this. And look, uh, women's research, I have fought since the day I walked into the House of Representatives uh, with regard to the issue on women's health research. What we found at the NIH all those years ago, but it's not that old, a long time. It's, it, it, it's you know 32 years ago. That's not a long time where women were not even a uh, uh, part of the clinical trials at the National Institutes of Health. And in fact, you, you, you know, they did this. And, and I'm, I'm told that even the mice are, you know, not female, but that women, uh, you know, the, the, the tests were done on men and, and the data was extrapolated to women. Well, we worked at trying to address that. We did. Um, and, uh, you know, that's the case. We still have to be very vigilant <laughs> to make sure that these studies uh, are, 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 being, are being done. Um, and there is a tremendous way to go to make sure that we are appropriately funding women's health research. So I said, we have come a, lo a long way. 
Um, but it's not, um, you know, there's still so much that needs to get done. I was very, very pleased with what we were able to do in the Appropriations Committee over the last two years. You know, $47.5 billion for the NIH, uh, a $2.5 billion above what we were able to do in 2022. Um, uh, so, uh, and $7.3 billion for the National Cancer Institute. Um, as well. Uh, uh, and, and what we did with women's health, and I, I don't, don't misunderstand, I don't mean to be self-serving, but I got tired of women's health, the decision on how much money would move in, in that direction was for us to have our own uh, uh, budget line for women's health research. The office was funded at the discretion of the director now it has dedicated funds and it has grant making authority. But women are, uh, that lack of research puts women at a significant disadvantage. We've made some progress, but we need to, uh, there's uh, much more to go. Yeah, thanks for um, expanding on that. Um, you know, we, we thank you for your leadership on that, <laughs> uh, on the, in the appropriation. For ARPA H. Uh, for, uh, uh, you know, there, and also at Health Resources and HRSA, at the Health Resources and Services uh, it, it Administration. So, I, I, you know, we have to use the tools uh, that uh, are available to us. And, and, and I, I'll just say this to you. Uh, we just received the, the, the copy of the 2024 uh, Labor, Health, Human Services, and Education Subcommittee Bill. My friends, you need to go into full born advocacy here. The, the, the cuts, and the cut to the NIH is about $2.8 billion. We That's were just talking about that. We thought it was astounding. You were able to make time considering today. Um, you know, we really appreciate it and we hear you for sure. Advocacy, we need your advocacy. Um, well, speaking of advocacy and other things that you're uh, leading and that we hope to support, um, the Find It Early Act. Let's talk about that. This uh, this legislation has received bipartisan support, yes. um, which is impressive. Yes. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, let's talk about the path forward for this bill in Congress and how we, the people, uh, can help support this bill. Sure. No, and I, this is so so much the, the action associated with this, and I appreciate you in this regard. I, I will tell you recently, you should know that uh, Congressman Stephen Horsford, uh, Brian Fitzpatrick, R Republican and I have, you, you know, introduced the bill. Actually, Katie Couric has been wonderful in, in being on the stump on this. But just recently, Congressman Horsford and I secured a provision in the uh, Defense Authorization Act, which just, um, got, got, got passed today. It would require briefings on the number of women service members and their dependents covered by TRICARE who require screening and diagnostic breast imaging, including mammograms, ultrasounds, breast ultrasounds, and MRIs. So we've got some, uh, and we're gonna just see what the numbers are, are here. But what we have to do, I'll be very frank with you, we just have 21 co-sponsors of Find It Early. In order to pass any bill in this institution, you have to have 218 votes. I need all of your efforts, all of your networks to really get out there and get to their members of Congress and get them to sign on to the legislation. Again, bipartisan. Right, okay. That's, that's <laughs> and it shouldn't be something that is Democratic women, Republican women, that's ridiculous. This is about the saving lives of women. Right. And cancer doesn't discriminate, as I like to say. Right? <laughs> no, cancer does not discriminate. So, right. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, we know that your time is very valuable. Um, did you have anything else you would like to share with our audiences and, uh, you know, the world uh, before we uh, let you go and save the world today? I, I, I thank you for that. But um, uh, I, I just think, despite, and again, I'll be frank, some of the political environment we are involved in. This is such a, a powerful issue. And we know, to be very honest with you, increased funding, increased efforts 
have been the result of the National Breast Cancer Coalition. When I look at what happens and how we have, how we've had increased research, how we've been able to go to the Department of Defense and get money there, that I think that the strength of this issue, and again, because it is bipartisan, that we need to be just shouting from the rooftops, not taking no for an answer. Advocacy groups ought to be going to district offices to their members and saying, you have to sign on to this legislation. That this is not about politics. This is about saving women's lives. Yeah, you mentioned something that I was going to ask, but since you opened the door, I'm going to ask this follow up. Uh, you talk about how it's affected to go to district offices, right? Um, can you you talk a little bit more about what's the best chance for these folks to get the ears of people like you? I, I think it is really obviously being in Washington, I, I don't discourage any people from coming and do that. But going to a district office, doing a, an op ed letter to the editor, because you know, I have run into so many groups that when I start to talk about dense breasts, you know, a dozen hands go up and say, oh my God, you know, I've been diagnosed with dense breasts, but they don't know what's out there. And that's why we have to use this as a tool to educate the members, yes. And I, I will tell you, if 15, 20 people show up in my district office and Jennifer, my director calls and she says, Rosa, there's all these people here on this issue, you pay attention, pay attention. Uh, uh, so, and people should talk about what it costs them, bring the bills with them and say, this is what it would cost me to get an MRI or an ultrasound. You got to get their attention there. And again, they, uh, people can stand up locally and do press uh, and, uh, and do, as I said, op-ed, get into local papers about this issue. So locally people understand what's happening. That is very helpful uh, crash course in uh, grassroots advocacy. I always think it helps to hear from representatives themselves right, on these issues. Um, Congresswoman, I just want to thank you again uh, for making the time for us today. Uh, we deeply appreciate your leadership and your work as a women's health champion. Um, you're welcome to stay on and listen, or I'm sure you, you know, have <laughs> places to go. I, I, I wish I could because I want to hear from others and I love, uh, you know, I love what you're doing here today. This is We'll so send you the recording, don't worry. Send the recording and please know how much I, I prize uh, our relationship and our partnership with getting things done. And whatever you need from me, I'm there, okay? Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Congresswoman DeLauro, everybody. Boy, that's pure serotonin, I have to say. <laughs> um, my next uh, few questions are for Ms. Joanne Pushkin, again, the executive director of densebreastinfo.org. We heard a little bit about dense breasts just now, um, and now we're going to do a deep dive on that. Um, so welcome, Ms. Pushkin. Um, here's my first question. What are dense breasts and, and why does it matter in this conversation about breast cancer? First of all, thank you for having me. We're delighted to partner on this educational effort and what a delight to hear Representative DeLauro and her engaged passion. It is contagious and she really has moved the bar forward on this. So thank you for uh, have, uh, making this forum available to discuss that. So what are dense breasts? Why are we all talking about them? So dense breasts are normal and common. And actually about 40% of women of mammography age have dense breasts. So what does it mean? Dense tissue refers to the tissue composition of your breasts. Your breasts are made of three kinds of tissues, fat, uh, glandular tissue, which is what makes the milk, and then fibrous tissue, which kind of holds it all together. So each woman's breasts are a distinct mix of uh, tissues, and the more glandular tissue and fibrous tissue a woman has, the denser her breasts are. Okay, so if they're normal and common, why are we even talking about it? Dense breasts show up white on a mammogram. And why does that matter? Cancer shows up white on a mammogram. And Ringo, if you can pull up the first slide, so here we see um, on the left, a mammogram of not dense breast, and none of us have gone to medical school, or I certainly haven't, and yet there I can see that cancer from across the room. Uh, and on the right-hand side is the mammogram of a dense breast, and even a large cancer is difficult to see. This would be completely obscured in the dense tissue, and that's what's so concerning. Um, and in addition 
to hiding cancer. I mean, people, it's, I've heard the analogy, it's like trying to find a snowball in a blizzard and you can well appreciate that. Uh, but not only does it hide cancer, but dense tissue increases the risk of a woman's, uh, increases her risk of developing breast cancer. So it's a double whammy. She's both more likely to get breast cancer and more likely for that cancer to be missed. And what's of concern is that for women like myself who were going faithfully for mammograms um, and my own cancer did not show up an estimated five years in a row on that mammogram is that the, mam the letter we were getting after our mammograms every one of those years simply said normal. Um, so you don't know what you don't know sometimes. You didn't, I didn't know to worry about it. Um, Ringo, if you can pull up the next slide. So, you know, is there a, what women don't realize is that a normal mammogram in a dense breast does not reliably mean that cancer is not present. And I don't know if you can see this. When you have your mammogram, your breast density is rated into four categories. Fatty breasts are the least dense at the bottom. Uh, then they're scattered, heterogeneously dense and extremely dense. So the, the top two categories, heterogeneously dense and extremely dense, if your breast density is rated into one of those two categories, you are considered to have dense breasts. So look at the percent of cancers that will not show on a mammogram. For women that extremely dense breasts, and I had extremely dense breasts, uh, that's the low end, 40%. That's, that's almost half. We're, we're, we're talking a coin to us here. And so it's so important for these women to have uh, additional screening after their mammogram, because look at all the cancers we're leaving on the table here, literally. Wow, that is an education. I'm so glad that you gave us those visuals um, because yeah, wow, you really can't see that cancer. <laughs> um, you know, and and so you talked a little bit about how, you know, mammograms are not the be all end all, especially if you have uh, dense breasts. Let's talk about what other breast screening tests can be done after a mammogram or in addition to, and when and how should a patient ask for additional tests? So the first thing to know, and I want to make this clear, is while mammograms are the first step in screening for all women, for women with dense breasts, they should not be the last. So the type of additional screening recommended will, you know, should be based on your density and other risk factors and whether you are determined to be at high risk. So high-risk women are people with a genetic mutation like the BRCA gene, uh, prior chest radiation, or other certain combinations of other risk factors like breast density, uh, family history, and uh, uh, prior biopsies. So if, if you have dense breasts and are not considered high risk, um, it's recommended that you, in addition to your annual mammogram exam, you consider an annual ultrasound or MRI because it will find cancers uh, that are hidden on the mammogram. And this is a conversation to have with your re referring provider, either your OBGYN or your family practitioner, when you, meet, when you meet with that person before you, when you get your script for your mammogram. So I'm going for my mammogram. Is it enough is the question. You know, did I, I have dense breasts last year? They will know. They can look at the report uh, last year and, and let's discuss my other risk factors. And is it enough? Uh, if you're high risk, if you're determined to be at high risk, whether or not you're dense, um, the recommendation is a screening, an annual screening MAMO and a yearly screening MRI. Um, and uh, Ringo, if you can pull up. And if you're a breast cancer survivor uh, and have not had a double mastectomy, uh, the recommendation is an annual mammogram and an annual MRI. If you had dense breasts or if you were diagnosed before the age of 50, whether you're dense or not. So here we see the cancer detection of other screening tests after a mammogram. So the, if a thousand women are screened with dense breasts and have just a 2D mammogram alone, the number of women found to have cancer will be five out of a thousand. If they do a 3D mammogram, it'll be six. 3D mammograms uh, do not drastically increase cancer detection uh, in dense breasts because it's the same, it's still an X-ray technology and X-ray technology is very affected by dense tissue. But after the mammogram, if we add an ultrasound, we see we find eight cancers per thousand women screened and look at the contrast enhanced MRI, 21 cancers. Um, some new technologies you might be hearing about, not as popular as ultrasound or MRI, but you'll be hearing about them is molecular breast imaging. And that finds 13 cancers per thousand women screened and then contrast enhanced MAMO finds 15 cancers. 
per thousand women screened. So, and there, the newest guidelines recommend that all women be given a breast cancer risk assessment with possible genetic testing by age 25. And again, this woman needs to speak to her OBGYN or primary care. So, um, for women who are determined to be at higher risk, they, the recommendation may be that they start mammogram screening before 40, or uh, if they're determined to be at high risk, the recommendation could be that they start MRI at 25. But of course, what we need coupled with that is once she's told that, she needs to be able to access and afford these screenings. Right. It's not just about the education. It's about the, yeah, the access. Well, do it. But- yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I will say, uh, first of all, you're a comms person's dream because these this takes very scientific information and makes it very understandable. I want to let everybody know all these resources are going to be available, are already available, I believe, on uh, the webpage um, and at densebreastinfo.org. Um, before I open the floor, you know, talk to me about, I mean, are providers, uh, you know, aware of these new recommendations, I and mean, what what work needs to be done in the provider space about, you know, educating and and why is self advocacy sometimes necessary uh, for this issue? And, the, and this is where the pedal meets the metal on this, and it's falling apart. Women need to under, women need guidance. They need to be told they have uh, that they're at higher risk. Uh, but if she doesn't know to ask, should the onus be on me as a patient to to know to tell you that? Shouldn't shouldn't my provider uh, be educated and ready to do risk assessment, to have a discussion about that and understand what supplemental screening I need. So we need patients uh, educated and their providers educated. When she turns to that referring provider to have a conversation, you know, is he ready? Is she ready? Right, right. Thank you for, you know, highlighting that. Um, Okay, so I am going to open the floor now to all of our panelists uh, for the rest of these questions. Speaking of providers, what can providers do to ensure patients are well informed <laughs> about their risk for breast cancer, especially if they have dense breasts? I'll take this one. Um, you know, I think Joanne already mentioned that providers need to be able to have this level of conversation, but also we need to be able to, as women, be able to go into the office and ask, what are my risks? Um, I don't know about your experiences, but it seems like when I would go into my OBGYN or my primary and they would do, you know, the, the breast exam, it was, in, it was done in silence. Or they may ask me if I had vacation plans, or they may ask me how are the kids, you know, I think somewhere between residency and clinics or however, you know, doctors, PAs are trained, they need to have the conversation around breast, but also as Joanne said, at the same time, we need to be able to be proactive about that too. So what are dense breasts? Go in with the question. What are dense breasts? Right. Well, and and just to you know follow up on that, you wrote a really incredible op-ed about your personal experience. And if I remember correctly, were you aware that you had dense breasts? I had no idea. It had never been mentioned to me um, that I had dense breasts. And I would of course go in regularly for my mammogram. Um, even had a situation where the radiologist thought she saw something, but then they did a sonogram later and, and they said, no, it was, it's nothing to worry about. Well, it was something to worry about, but they never said you have dense breasts. Let's keep an eye on it at all. Which that's scary. And uh, we'll be sure again, the, her op-ed for the whole experience is linked to the, um, on the page. Um, Joanne, do you have anything to add to that? My own experience was similar, of course. I, I mean, I found out I had breast cancer. I found out it was missed because of dense tissue. And I found out I had dense tissue all within 10 minutes of each other. Um, just to clarify, dense breasts have nothing to do with the way your breasts look or feel. It's determined on your mammogram. Um, so, And that's why it's so important, for, you know, of all the risk factors we're going to talk about, my family history, uh, what my, fa- my personal mm-hmm. history, my lifestyle, the only, of all of those, the only one that someone needs to tell me is my breast density. That's the one I'm relying on. I can't see inside my breast, so I need someone to tell me that. And that's why it's, notification is so important uh, in, in this sense. And we really need these referring providers to, you know, the as Representative Deloro said, the national reporting standard is coming. It's already in 38 states, already 90% of women receive some level of notification. Some of them are way better than others. Uh, but certainly referring providers need to have a protocol for patient risk assessment. They need to get to get ready and get their game face on for that. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so speaking of, uh, <laughs> so you find out, um, you find out, oh no, you get this bad news, right? You have dense breasts and maybe you have cancer. Um, or maybe you don't find out, right? Because the costs of additional screenings are so dissuasive from seeking preventative care. Um, so, you know, what are some tips with dealing with the the sticker shock and that cost of, you know, when you're having to make those choices? Um, you know, uh, let's talk about that. Well, since I, I'm here for the lived experience, yeah, um, I I got online and started to look for clinical trials. Because right. And we're going to talk about, talk about why you did that. Cause that <laughs> is something not everybody would do. I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I'm that type of person, um, but also <laughs> um, just having had experience with uh, the American Cancer Society, understanding that there are opportunities out there to, to really address some of those health issues um, head on. And I wanted to make sure that um, I had the best information out there. Well, and it's also true that, you know, it's customary, right? That if you are accepted into a clinical trial, um, it's no cost to you. Is that right? It is no cost to you. Yeah. And that was your experience, right? That was my experience with my clinical trial. And I was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. So it's very aggressive. Uh, it moves very quickly. Um particularly if you have dense breasts and it is not uh, diagnosed, uh, it quickly moves into the lymph nodes. It's, it's, it's fast moving. Um, I, I, and having that shock of hearing the news, one, you have cancer, two, it was undiagnosed because you had dense breasts and it wasn't seen. Um, and three, you know, it's triple negative. I, I was in a stupor for like, you know, I don't know, a day before I could really gather my thoughts and say, okay, this is what I need to do. You know, I called every particular doctor I could find, you know, that I knew I called um, uh, a couple of uh, clinical trials just to see if I could get in. But because I was fortunate enough to be here in DC and to be here with at Georgetown, it was easy to get into the clinical trial that they had. So you, Denise, your, your experience was that you got into this clinical trial. Um, Joanne, what about folks who maybe, you know, are ineligible for those trials? Do you have any additional tips on controlling costs or at least exploring cost options for, for treatment? So as you all know, um, I'm executive director of the educational website, densepressedinfo.org. And by far, by far, 99% of the emails that come into us to our contact us page are from women who are trying to navigate uh, the cost of additional screening. So, uh, you know, it's extremely frustrating to them if their doctor says, yes, you need this, and the insurance company denies it, which is their right, uh, or it's covered, uh, but the copay and deductible are too high. And we hear from women, uh, just heard from, actually, she was a reporter, the copay and deductible with good insurance for her MRI was $1,400. You know, that's with insurance. Um, or frustration, you know, about 22 states, I think it is now, have expanded insurance laws uh, for additional screening after your mammogram. Not all of them are uh, without copay and deductible, but some of them are. But there are so many plans that are exempt from state insurance laws. So, for instance, in New York, we passed the first very progressive law that all screening and diagnostic imaging both were to be covered at no cost to the patient. And we thought we this was fabulous and we're done. And then of course my phone begins to ring. So self-funded plans um, are exempt from state laws. And the only way a woman can know is to ask her, uh, the administrator of her policy, it is, a, is it a self-funded plan? It's not like an HMO where the number is different or the card is different. You have to ask. Well, who would know to ask? Like I'm glad <laughs> again, who would know to ask? Who would even know to ask that question? Absolutely. Um, out of state plans, are exempt. So if uh, if you're in New York and you're thinking, oh, this is going to be covered, but you work for a company that's uh, based in Kentucky, it'll be that state's law that determines your coverage no matter where you're having that testing. And of course, federal plans like Medicare are exempt from state laws. Wow. There's a lot of loopholes. That's a, lot like of loopholes. A, so a rodeo of loopholes. That's right, but to the great credit, uh, to Rosa DeLauro, Representative DeLauro and Fitzpatrick, and we worked very hard with them. The bill is extremely comprehensive and will close these loopholes. This is it early. this bill is important. Correct. Even in states where there are insurance laws, this will expand coverage in those states. 
And I, I'll pass on this tip too for anybody who is in that situation right now. I do, I do hear from women who, even though they have insurance, will call the imaging center and say, what's the cash price? In other words, if I had no insurance, what would you charge me for this screening for the ultrasound or the MRI? And believe it or not, sometimes it's cheaper than their copay and deductible. Um, and, and, and I always, if you're really stuck and you should have that screening if it's recommended, it, sometimes it's worth a call to the imaging center to find out you know, if there are any considerations can be given if you have a very high deductible plan and really need that screening. Wow, yeah, these are things, these are steps that not, I think not everybody realizes like the the on the ground labor of negotiation with insurance companies and is is currently passed on to the consumer, right? And a lot of people don't know that. So, um, you know, thank you for your work on the Find It Early Act. This is one of those. This is one of those bills that was actually helped be. It was written by an expert in the field, right? Um, so that's that's always good. Um, and we're yeah. Um, so we talked about the cost barrier, right? But there are other barriers uh, that exist to getting good cancer care. And I was hoping, you know, Denise could speak to that a little bit. Um, I think if you look at the barriers of um, uh, racial inequity and representation in clinical trials, you'll see that a lot of clinical trials do not uh, include people of color, do not include African-Americans or have not routinely done that just to see um, or to value the efficacy of that particular trial. Um, so that's that side. And then there's, a, of course, the, the, the side of, of trusting the medical community of whether or not this is, this is really going to help me or is this going to hurt me, you know, do the risk outweigh the benefits for that. And a lot of people of color and African-American community are going to be thinking about that when looking at clinical trials because of the history of the medical community's practices on Black bodies. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's a long and horrifying history. Um, you know, can you talk about then some of the green flags? I like to say the opposite of red flags um, that maybe these communities can look for if they are seeking out clinical trials or, or something like that. Um, if, if you have the opportunity to talk to the uh, maybe the investigators on the clinical trial, the medical staff involved with the clinical trial, interview them as they are interviewing you. Because they're going to always ask for interviews, you know, to see if you're going to be a candidate for their trial, if you're going to be a good candidate, but also see if, if they're going to be a good candidate for and a resource for you in case you have questions. One of the things I experienced is that the medical group with my clinical trial, they were available to me 24-7. That was a huge green flag to me. If I had any kind of twitch, pain, question, worry, they returned my call. They were there for me. Um, that's always a good thing to look for. Also, uh, look for a clinical trial that um, provides all your resources. So you don't have to worry about any kind of out-of-pocket expenses. Or if there are out-of-pocket expenses, they can connect you to other resources that can help you know, supplement those other expenses. So some of those clinical trials will also do that. Um, other people are maybe more interested in what is, is there monetary value in doing this clinical trial? Will I get paid? Some will, some may pay you. Um, for me personally, that was not an issue for me. Um, I went into my clinical trial knowing that I could, uh, I could have a list of 500 potential, uh, side effects because of the drug, but I was willing to take that risk if it meant saving my life. I'm glad you brought that up because one thing that that shines clear in your op-ed is is before any trial was started, um, they really made sure that you had informed consent. Um, can you speak a little bit to that process? Wow. So that process, um, it was intense. And I'll say because I had to really, again, weigh the risk of this. What would I could what could I potentially be walking away with? What is the worst of the risk? What are the least? And I could just only pray that I would walk away with the least. Um, but it was also on me to ask questions of my surgeon, made sure they coordinated care with my primary care, made sure I coordinated care with, uh, with my uh, reconstructive surgeon, okay? Because I wanted to do everything at once. That was my decision. But... Um, yeah, it was it was it was really having a committee meeting with all of the the doctors and 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 medical staff involved to make sure that I had my care taken you know taken care of. 
Right. Oh. Right. Joanne, uh, any additional thoughts on other barriers besides cost to getting good breast cancer care? Uh, not related to um, clinical trials, but certainly for screening. I mean, clearly there are disparities in outcomes uh, in Black and Hispanic women, and there's been a call for more research on the issue across uh, minorities. And because these women are more often diagnosed at a much earlier age, sometimes in their 20s, uh, these women in particular uh, may benefit from risk assessment by the age of 25. We had mentioned that before, but it's a particularly important in these communities. And again, if they're determined to be at increased risk and to need uh, insurance coverage for that screening, it, it should be covered. Uh, and, and certainly um, on the individual patient level, certainly language is a barrier uh, and a concern. Uh, if the patient doesn't understand the information being given or shared uh, to her, uh, what good is it to her? Um, for instance, Spanish speakers are the fastest growing segment of the US population, and there is a need for patient materials in Spanish, uh, but translated by medical professionals. You just don't go to a Google Docs translate. We need it by medical professionals. And um, if anyone is interested in that, on the densebreastinfo.org website, we have an entire suite of content in Spanish, things you can print and videos, FAQs. Uh, uh, and we also have a patient fact sheet about dense breast in over 30 languages that can be downloaded. So part of access is comprehension. I need to know, you know, I, it's only as, the information is only as good as I can perceive it, understand it, and act on it. Amen. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and thank you for creating all those resources. Um, those are also linked on the event page. Um, all right. Well, does anyone have any final remarks? Um, and this is your chance to, you know, plug anything. This is, this is the speak now moment of the webinar. Well, I, if I could pipe up. Uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I'd like to uh, please everyone with dense breasts, uh, but both patients and health providers, please visit densebreastinfo.org. It's the world's leading resource on the topic. It is meticulously medically sourced uh, and specific to the Find It Early Act. And you he heard Representative Deloro say, we need feet on the ground about this. Uh, we'll be, our organization will be making a tremendous push on this next month. Uh, but in the meantime, if you need to know what I don't, I've never called my congressperson, who is he? Who is she? How, what do I do? Please go to uh, finditearlyact.org. It's on our page on our website. There's a lobbying 101 section about how do I ask my congressperson for support. It tells you what to ask, how to make the appointment, what to bring, how to follow up. It walks everyone through it. So no one has an excuse not to call the congressperson, finditearlyact.org. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> we're on notice. And since, you know, there is uh, an increase of breast cancer diagnosis with uh, uh, people of color and African-American women, I would uh, particularly uh, guide them to the triple negative um, breast cancer foundation, you know, because that's that is a common diagnosis that we see particularly in African-American women, it was with triple negative breast cancer. So go to that foundation, go to that website, look at what they have available for clinical trials, just, and, and they are very um, open to talking to you about what's available. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. Um, well, uh, thank you all uh, for joining us today. Um, we will be transcribing this um, and we will be uh, posting the recording for this event uh, next week. And anybody who registered will get it in their inboxes um, along with a feedback survey. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time uh, you know, to get educated with us today. Um, I'm gonna hand it right on over to the two executive directors if they wanna end it with anything, <laughs> but I think we're good, are we good? Thank everyone for attending this and um, you know listening to to this this panel discussion. I think it's important that we continue to educate everyone around this issue. But just looking at women's health in general, we are here to be you know the advocates for that. So thank you, Joanne, for for joining us. No, oh, thank you for having me. And this was such an opportunity. Thank you. Take care, everybody. This is us signing off.